Hi, I'm Dr. Natalie Bittaturi. I'm the chief of staff of the Simba Group of Companies and the founder of Her and Musana Carts. Simba Group is a family-owned business in Uganda that has been around for more than 20 years and employs hundreds of people. We work across telecom, hospitality, real estate and energy. My job is really to oversee strategy and operations across the different sectors within the different companies. Musana Carts is a solar street food vending company. We provide physical units for Rolex vendors, as well as training in financial literacy, hygiene and sanitation, and marketing and customer service. Her is an online platform for African women. It's all about supporting women in their journey and their careers through online courses and an online community and one-on-one -on -one coaching. Moving forward, I believe my role in Simba just becomes easier and easier as it's a big institution and is very strong and consistent in operations now. I'm very passionate about social businesses because they go above and beyond just making profit. It's also about making a positive impact in your community, which is why I started Musana Karts and Her. When I look at the current situation with the youth in Uganda, I believe they need more access to skills and opportunities and through these different projects, I'm able to support that endeavor. With Musana Carts, we're able to provide dignified employment for vendors. They run their own businesses, they make more money, and they're very proud of what they do. Musana Carts was begun with only Rolex, and now we also do chicken carts. And we look at different ways we can support street food vendors and different things we can add to the carts to make their work better. With her, I feel like we need to empower young women and it's much harder for them to have access to skills and opportunities because there's so many young mothers, caregivers, and we don't have as much access to money or time. So by providing online courses, you can provide skills and knowledge that's flexible and affordable. And then with the community, women feel the support that they need with other ladies who are also trying to advance their careers and their businesses. You can see me talking, but you can't hear me. <laughs> check, check. Right. Yeah, welcome to Business Garage. Sorry about that small glitch. Really good to see you. Thank you for coming out. We have a serious studio audience here. Yeah. We also, you should be in the studio, by the way. You can just come, yeah, and be part of this warm dog audience. But also those of you at home watching us from across the world, thank you so much for being here. My name is Beatri, and as always, we bring you stories of Ugandan, real Ugandans, eh? Ugandan business people who are thriving here in this nation. And we bring their stories to you to inspire you, to challenge you and to help you to grow. And we know that you've been absolutely blessed, but right now what I need you to do, those of you online, share this link share the link share the link share the link i'm especially excited about today's guest because they are different and you're going to see how but i'd like you to help me make welcome to business garage dr natalie vitature welcome tali welcome welcome i hope your microphone is on i think so it's not Mm. Oops, oops. Microphones today are uh, a bit of a strange thing happening, but we will conquer, we will overcome. Great. Um, why am I excited about Natalie? Let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Natalie as, 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 as you're about to hear her voice. But I'm especially excited about her because she represents something that we dream about, that we talk about a lot here at Worship Harvest, and that we know is going to become more of a reality than a, a rare thing. And that is a person who, who represents generational business. Here, Ugandan generational business. I remember a time when we asked about 
generational businesses of Ugandans in a congregation of like 500 people and ask them to name a fourth generation business of Ugandans. We couldn't. We could only find people who came to Uganda who are not originally Ugandan and they, they, they are the ones who've built a fourth, a fourth generation of business. But I love the story of Dr. Natalie because guess what? We have, at least it's a second generation business, yes? <laughs> We're starting somewhere, people! There's hope! <laughs> so welcome. Now we can hear your voice. Thank you so much. Yay! Yes. All right, and she's also a young woman, so it's, everything is exciting about your story, yes. So Natalie, why don't we start by talking about the beginnings how do you get into business? Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> um, personally, I never had to think about it. Business is what we sort of grew up at every dining table, everywhere we went, <laughs> whatever we went doing. So it was never really a thought of choice. It was just when do I get to be fully in the business? Wow. So from when I was much younger, I'd go to work with my dad, with my mom, and go to sites, go to meetings, and hide under the table when I was a kid and listen and take. And even as a teenager, I'd work with my dad's assistant in my old days and ask her phone, hello, I just phone. Wow. <laughs> so it was just always something that was around and I was excited to dive in when I got older. So but that right there is what is a bit different. I was talking to you earlier and saying that many young Ugandans who have the privilege of having a parent start something are not excited to dive in. <laughs> they want to start their own thing. Uh, and we'll talk about the fact that you've also started some things that are, yes, your own, in your own right. But first, because you say you were excited to dive in, some people are like, ah, no, I'm going to, I want to be my own person. That's my dad's stuff. And I want to start my own thing. So why were you excited to dive into business? Why? Why not start your own thing and, yeah, no, not have to continue something that your parents started? I never thought about it as not my own. I think that's oh. the difference with my parents. They always included us in everything. They didn't keep things separate. We always knew what was going on, whether it's good times or bad times, whether it was stressful or exciting. So I always also felt it's mine, even when I was a kid. So once I was older and I had to start taking ownership, my dad always encouraged, yes, you must be responsible. Everything here is yours. So if something goes wrong, I'm going to come for you. You wow. need to take ownership. And I remember, I think I was like 21 and he left me on a construction site and I had to manage with all these adults and I felt like a kid yeah. and I saw a broken light. One of the new lights had just been broken because someone was careless and I was so upset. <laughs> That's my light. I know how much that light costs. Yeah. How can this happen? <laughs> we have to be responsible. And I think that's where I started to realize it's also mine and I also have to take ownership of it because being a generational business, I have to think of my own kids. Wow. I need to make sure that I leave what my father built for my own children in good condition that's successful and that's running and that's grown and that's impacted other people's lives. So I've always felt like that's a part of our family businesses and I hope that I can continue to impart that. Wow. Ownership, you can feel it, like it's not even because of good conversation, it's from the heart. So you're talking about how, you know, ownership and, 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 and now for you it's not that this is something my parents started outside of myself, but it's a part of me. But now there are people watching right now who are like, yeah, of course, I mean, you have it easy. <laughs> <laughs> She's laughing, like, hey, you're so funny. Yeah, because look, there's no one really, if there's someone in Uganda who doesn't know your parents, name, that last name, Bitature, means something, okay? So, I mean, someone is probably watching and going, of course, you have to succeed. Of course, it must be easy for you. But let's talk about what you've had. What are some of the things that people may not know that as a normal business person, you have to also go through to grow what you've been given, and not only that, just because it's been given to you means that naturally, somehow, you should be able to grow it. What, 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 what are some of the things we don't know that, that would be good for someone to know who thinks this one has it easy? Mm. If only, if only. If only it was that easy. <laughs> um, I also don't feel like I've been given anything. Wow. Yeah, that, that phrase, I'm like, hmm. <laughs> it was not just handed. Yeah. You have to work for things. And I think that's something I realized a few years ago, maybe when I was in my early 20s, 
you have to wake up, you have to be there. Like, if you're on a site and you have to pay people, you have to be there on time. Whether you had a party last night, whether you're tired, whether you feel sick, when you're given a responsibility or a budget or a deadline or there's a customer that needs you, you have to answer your phone. You have to smile for every customer. You have to be there physically and do things and listen and learn and stress and struggle. And there's no way to avoid that. I don't know who can be given a business and they just sit pretty. It's not a business then, they're not running it. If you're not stressed, you're not working. It's not business. So you, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes and you have to be able to do both things. Now that I've worked in a hotel for a few years, we have front of house, back of house. Front of house, you're always smiling, you're always responding to customers. You have to say yes, you have to get whatever they need. Back of house, you're in the trenches. You're stressing, you're moving stuff, you're struggling, you're in meetings, you're in Excel sheets, you're in presentations. It's, it's crazy. And sometimes when I see the different businesses, I see that... I am not like an engineer or a hotel background or something in particular. So I have to move from business to business and use the same skill set across different sectors, wow. which means I have to be very present. I have to research all the time. I have to read all the emails, all the reports. I need to understand what the difference is on a construction site, in the restaurant, in the bar, with Musana, and it's constant work. So a lot of the time I'll have a full day of back-to-back -back meetings. From 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., I've learned how to drink my food because I drink don't get it. up to go for lunch. It's smoothies, it's shakes, it's soup in a cup. It looks like I'm drinking coffee the whole day. It's because I can't go for lunch. I have a meeting. As soon as you leave the office, sure. someone is here. We have this problem. We have this challenge. We need this. How about this? What about this? And I saw my dad live like this for years, so it was never a choice for me. I never thought there's another way to run businesses. I can just sit in an office and someone else does something. No. You just go. You keep going. Because they need you and the businesses need you. They need your attention and your time and your care and your effort. And that's something I really try to teach young people in business. The challenge is young people think you get some investment, do a few days of stress and struggle, yeah. and then you're rich yes. immediately. Yes. Six months, I should be rich. Yeah, why oh, not? Okay. Tell me how that goes. <laughs> It's very, it, you have to, it's so intense, but I think that's also what I love about it. It's so demanding and it's so necessary, but you get to see the fruits of your labor. Mm. After weeks and years and months of that struggle, sometimes you'll turn around and be like, oh wow, it's a good day. Things are working well. Yeah. Things look good. The yeah. customers are happy. Okay, it's <laughs> worth it. Wow, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that statement you made about, yeah, tell me someone who's been handed a business and they sit pretty and somehow it all works out, then it's not a business. So you can feel the intensity and the passion and the, you know, coming through. But what's a, we're, we're about to, because you then talked about earlier on uh, in, the, in the introduction that you're very passionate about social businesses. If you could tell us, before we get into her and, and Musana, there's something I remember hearing about uh, that you were involved in, where you had to move to Ivanda for six months, uh, and not because you were sent there, it was you. Uh, so tell us about that. <laughs> so that was Project 500K. Um, we had been talking about doing something for the youth, and my dad is also very passionate about the youth and training and business. So in one of his busy days, he's like, figure out something for the youth in Ivanda, get it done moved on. So I got some helpers. We made a team. We built a curriculum that was a six-week program that trains young people in 21st century skills. So for business, like communication and teamwork and to think about their careers and their goals. Then we moved to Ibanda with the team. We recruited there as well. It was a trainer-trainer program. So we had about 150 trainers from different vocational schools, from church groups, different parishes. The LCs helped us. You would get an SMS every morning on your phone if you were registered with like an inspirational quote and a question. And then weekly you would be in groups from your peers and you learn together about the skills. And then once a week we'd have a radio show on the local radio station and have a guest talking about the skill who's an expert. And it was such an exciting experience. It's the first time I got to really interact um, with young people and see the difference with young people who are in the rural community, yes. their challenges, their lack of access as well, and how limited their options were. 
And it was really great to see it by the end of it. You can see the spark in someone when they feel like they have agency over their life. Like, now I know what I need to do. Yeah. Okay, now I get this. I can do it too. Yeah. And now they know how to plan something, to make goals, how to ask for money, how to start businesses. So it was really exciting and it really connected me more to working with young people and using business as a tool for empowerment. Wow. And why did you move to Ivanda for six months? Why couldn't you do it on the telephone? You have to be there. <laughs> You can't do things on the phone. If anything, I know how to do all my Kampala work on the phone from Ibanda. Oh, you had to still run your work in Kampala? Yes, who was I going to leave to do it? I mean, it's Ibanda. Ibanda is not... I There's don't know. network challenges. Ibanda, we There's love internet you, but challenges. No. Moving to Ibanda for six months? No. But yeah. it was worth A it. A young person, you know, you're missing your friends, the <laughs> cinema, everything all the good. Parties. All the parties. And you moved... There. But you said it was a six-week program. Why were you there for six whole months? Because first, you don't just go in and decide what it's going to be. We mm -hmm. moved with the team to also first do research, speak to the young people. We did focus groups and surveys and understand what do you need? How can we help? We don't want to just be one of these NGOs that comes and says, the youth need capacity building in this. We've decided. Mm -hmm. Have. So first, you have to work with them. You need to understand the community. We needed to see the range. I didn't know how big Ibanda was. Mm. I've been to town yeah. and the house, and that's <laughs> it. There's so many little parishes and villages, and if it rains, you can't get there. The road is washed out, and you need a connection. And it's not like here where there are Buddha Buddhas everywhere. Mm. So there was a lot of research that went into it and time. And also, over the six months, we did the course twice. Ah. So that's how we got to 5,000 youth strained by the end of it. 5,000? Wow. And that was totally charity, just giving back. And that's something that I know you're very passionate about. So now let's talk about, we've, we've just been talking about the family business and we'll come back to it. By the way, remember you can engage with us online. You can send us questions. You can ask Natalie whatever. Some of you are probably curious. Dr. Natalie, this is a young woman. Yeah, that's a question we're going to ask her. How did she become, is she a medical doctor? What happened? Uh, but we'll get into that. But ask the questions. If they're great questions, we will you know, ask her right here on the set. But Natalie, let's talk about some of the things that you have birthed as, as, as yourself. Let's talk about Musana. Where does that come from? Why are you, what, what? just tell us about it. Sure. Mm -hmm. So Musana Cuts is a Stola street food vending company that I started almost by accident. Uh -huh. I had entered a business competition when I was studying social business. And I was looking for a business that can impact a community and what are the different challenges that people have. So when you look at energy, that gives a big difference in someone's life. Mm -hmm. There are lots of solar power energy ads that show how kids can study at night because now they have access to light. So I was thinking, how can energy help in businesses? And I spent some time in different markets doing research to see how can we do something with solar power that's going to help someone who works in a market setting. Mm -hmm. And we realized that street food vendors are working almost 24 hours. You can get Rolex at any time. Yes. And half the time, they don't have power. They're using charcoal stoves, which is yeah. not great for their health. They don't have light bulbs. A few we found was tapping electricity illegally, which is also <laughs> dangerous. So we talked to them and tried to figure out what we can do, and we built a few different prototypes with which kind of cut is most helpful. And then the final one we decided on was the one which had solar power. And since then, we've now even managed to have fridges in all the Musana carts. So you can wow. keep food, you can keep cold drinks. That's how we have a partnership with Coca-Cola. We now have chicken carts, which have freezers, so they can keep the chicken in the cart and it's safe, and then you defrost and you cook it. So there's so many different things, just having access to energy in these settings. You can have a cart anywhere, because it's solar yeah. powered. You don't need a socket or electricity or anything. You can have it where you want. And then, of course, once you discover that, how else can we help? So we also give financial literacy training, so they have like good bookkeeping skills. Um, hygiene and sanitation, so that you make sure there's no yeah. food poisoning. And then marketing and customer service, which they all really love. Yeah. <laughs> the vendors love that part of the training the most. <laughs> and it's just something that I've really been passionate about, and it kind of just grew on its own. So now we're trying to expand and do different ideas. So we let vendors tell us what they want, and mm. then we figure out how to build it in Katwe and try different like products and different things to make sure that it serves the need for them and their customers. Wow. How many carts do you have out there right now? Now there's about 40. 40? Yeah. Wow. And only growing because now it works. How, how are they able to, are, are, are they, are they, would a regular vendor be able to afford one? Oh, they're all regular vendors. I don't own any Musana cards. <laughs> 
It's a vendor's cart. Wow. They pay a deposit, mm -hmm. we give them the cart, the training, and then they use mobile money and they pay back slowly every week. Usually about a year, 18 months, they've paid the full loan and wow. it's theirs. Wow. So good. That is all social business, really. Um, now, so that's the Musana cart. I, I can't wait for it for it to grow and they're everywhere. I mean, I want you to imagine those Rolex stands in Kampala, which are in the hundreds of thousands, if all of them were clean, using solar energy, with fridges, with, I, we'd all eat our Rolex with even more confidence. So Musana Katz needs to really expand. But let's talk about her. I know that you're very passionate about that and where it started, where it is. Again, it seems like you also sort of by accident, right? <laughs> Even this one sounds the same. Like, and yet it's not accidental because you had to then do something intentional to make it work. So let, tell us a bit about that. Um, so I started doing videos on Facebook just about business tips. I was interviewed for Young Achievers Awards and the videography team was like, you're so easy to interview. You know business things so much. Yet you're a woman. You should tell people these things. And I was like, <laughs> okay. Oh, but wow. they're like, you do it well, so make videos. I was like, if that's helpful, sure. Just time from me doesn't cost me anything. And I started to do more and more videos on Facebook and people really liked them. I was surprised. And I started to get women sending me messages in my inbox. Can you give me advice on this? How do I do this? How did you do this? What about this? And I was like, okay, sure. And then the messages start to become many. So I started giving out my phone number, and then the WhatsApps became many. <laughs> so I sat with my assistant, and we made a WhatsApp group. And it started with like 60 women. So we talk every day about different topics or challenges. They share their posters or their business ideas, and I give them feedback. Then they started adding their sisters, oh. their friends. It became 200 women. You reached the <laughs> WhatsApp limit. Then there were two groups. And now I'm trying to work all day, and it's ding, 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 ding. Yeah. And I was like, okay, we have to find a system. Yeah. Either it's one day a week or it's this time or it's what. And then actually when lockdown happened mm. and now I had more time because the hotels were closed, most of the businesses were yeah. closed. I was like, let's move to Facebook because Facebook, you can have a group and there's no limit. And then I can still interact with them one-on-one -on -one like this. So we moved to Facebook in March last year. Now there's 2,000 and something women in the group, and it's so active. Everyone shares their businesses, <laughs> their stories, their ideas. I keep making videos. I've done some interviews with other women with different stories about their careers. Wow. I make the short videos, share articles, share links, share inspirational quotes, anything that I can yes. to like help to support and grow the women. And then now we also have courses where you can buy a course and go through it with time and you get all online and you can watch it on your phone. You get worksheets, so you do the homework. And then I also do one-on-one -on -one sessions with them. If you ask, I'll be like, yes, let's talk about it. Have you done this? How is this going? To make sure that we're supporting young women because they have so many more challenges. I get a lot of angry guys on my Facebook. Why don't you support men? Yeah, I was going to ask Help you as well. Natalie, why don't you support men? I tell them just, my dad has a Facebook page. Just go follow him. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> men have more access to opportunities. They don't have the same challenges. You know, Africa has the most mothers in the world. Oh, yeah. I didn't we know start that. having children younger than anyone else in the world, and we have more. And then African women are also <laughs> you start caregivers. And you have more. Yeah. <laughs> so African women have challenges. They're not going to be able to spend time and money on internships or extra degrees or courses or night school. They have relatives to look after. They have kids to look after. They have other pressures. So I wanted to see how we can get to these women who have all these dreams and hope, and they have work ethic, but they just don't know how to take that first step to make the leap, to start the business or to advance their career, how to negotiate for your salary or to read a contract or to dress for an interview. Small things like that yeah. are not being taught in school. It's true. So if you're not going to spend time searching on YouTube to find exactly what you need, come join her. At least we put everything there for you so it's easy, it's convenient, it's flexible, and it's cheap. So you don't have to buy a whole business degree or spend four years. We'll tell you what you basically need to know and you get started and moving. Wow. <laughs> Wow, hmm? innovation, heart, passion, and, and, and I like that you eventually made it a course that people would pay for. What got you to that point? Because I know that you did not want to ask people to pay for this, which is something you clearly inherit from your parents. Giving, 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 giving. Everything needs to be given away. But what let, got you to that? Because we are business people, and sometimes business people feel guilty about social enterprise, especially, 
earning from it or because you feel like I need to give back and that's noble but it's value that you're giving and value should come back to you and there's nothing evil about that and I think it also empowers the person receiving value because they have put their value in there to get value so it's sort of theirs in a sense but what what got you eventually convinced to actually start charging for her so the first course I had started to film in the Facebook group, and I just thought, what are the most important things that have helped me in my career? And I thought about them, what are the things in order, and I had filmed a series and put them in the group. So hundreds of women had watched them and gone through it, and they were giving good feedback. And I was like, this is great, because this is how I can reach on scale. I don't have time to give every single woman like individual time. And I was talking to one of my mentors about it, and she said, you have to charge. I was like, no, that defeats the purpose. I'm trying to help women who don't have access to these kinds of things. She said, remember how Oprah had that program in South Africa and she gave out like cows to all these women? Within a year, all of them had sold the cow, the cow had died, it something had the happened. Cow. They had <laughs> it was gone. And you're back to square one. And so people need to feel sacrifice mm -hmm. to value something, wow. then they take it seriously and then they apply it in their lives. And I thought about it, because I'm like that also, and me, I'm stingy. If I've paid for something, mm. I have to squeeze every last drop out, out of, of it. it. <laughs> I can't waste it. I can't, I'm not those people who pay for gym membership and never go. Oh. I can't. If I've paid, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so I thought, you know what, if I can understand that, let me try this and do it this way. Mm. And it works. Yeah. The women who paid are so active. They send me messages, they leave comments, they tell me, give me feedback. I spoke to a group of them last week, 10 of us in our chat. And it's making such a difference in their lives. Wow. One of them is like, I wake up every day now at 6 a.m. and I go running. I was like, girl, I don't do that. <laughs> How are you doing that from a course I've taught you? Yeah. But they're so grateful and they've benefited so much and they take it seriously. Because too often we sit and watch stuff on YouTube or on yep. Facebook and like, oh, that's good, that's true. I should do that, I should do it. When you've paid for it, you better do it. So you, you will. feel, aha, uh -huh, I got the value, it was yes, worth it. Yes, totally. And I think that's something we've said a lot here at Business Garage is... Africa, if there's something that we've suffered from, is free things. They throw money at us, throw, and it does not, hasn't solved the problem. Free things, free things, free things. But when you pay for something and you've earned it, mm. it empowers you. And I think that that's really great. Uh, but let me ask some questions from the, the people on social media. Joanita Bukenya says, for those from the diaspora who are trying to come back and build the country, What's your advice for us? And I think she's asking because she knows that you went to school outside of Uganda. And for many people, when you go, you, many people don't want to come back. That's the truth. They go and maybe it looks like there's more opportunity there. You might be able to, you know, get more done. So they're asking from, I think, a place of, what, you're, you're here, you came back, you seem to be happy. Please tell us what, you know, give us some advice. What's your advice for those of us who are trying, even say trying, not who want, but who are trying to come back and build the country. What's your advice for us? You come. <laughs> you just have to come. You can't try, you can't plan everything. You just have to pack up and say, I've gone. Yeah. Say bye, sell your car, sell your house, say, I've gone, and I'm not coming back. Then you'll be determined to make it. Because the truth is, we need everyone here. Yes. It's really, it's so exciting when I see Ugandans in the news abroad, the scientists and doctors, and they've invented this and they've done that. I'm like, Ugandans are smart. We are awesome. It's true. You know? But we don't want to come back and do it here. And I understand the challenges, because it's also really frustrating when you get used to like efficient systems in other countries yeah then you come home and you're like well but someone built those yeah people from their country also put in time and effort so exactly. you have to come back here and then that's how we'll make the change i have a cousin who it took me two years to convince her to leave america i was like pack and come just come you yes. can live with me yes. i will help you you can work you can start a business whatever you need just come and now she loves it she went to visit her family the other day. She's like, I miss Uganda. I can't believe I'm saying it. Yes. <laughs> but Uganda life here is, is great. Yes. And there's so much potential. Any sector you can think of, there's potential in Uganda. There's, we're such an early stage country. Yes. There's so much room for growth. And once you've seen what's possible, mm. you, you even think in a bigger way. Sometimes when I've spoken to some of these young people like in Ibanda, they don't even know something exists that's out there. But someone who's lived abroad, you've seen it, you've touched it, you've seen how it works, come and make it at home. Yes. And don't just copy, you can make it better. Yes. You can make it suitable for us. We need so many solutions in Africa and we need to come up with the solutions ourselves. We can't just copy and paste what worked for other people. But it takes that time and energy and innovation. And I think there's so much potential. You just have to take the leap, be brave and come home. But Natalie, you sound like you're 
80 years old, lived so long, so wise, so I don't know what, like what's going on here? I mean, we're, people are just looking at you like, what you love? like why, where does this love for Uganda come from? You're looking at me like, why wouldn't what? I love Uganda? What do you mean? There's someone asking you, they're trying to come back. What do you mean trying? Come! <laughs> no one is stopping you. It's just, in, it, you have to do it. But why? Why do, you, why do you believe in this country and in the potential of this country? Uh, why? Where does that come from? It has to come from somewhere. I think it's the people. Ugandans can be very frustrating, I understand, but they're also amazing. When you sit down and talk to someone, the honesty, the yes. passion, we're such friendly, open, good people. Yes. You can talk to anyone, you get lost, if something happens, the other day I entered a ditch with my car. Like in 10 seconds, 10 people had come around to help me to lift my car out of the hole. I'm mm. just like, that's so nice. Yeah. I didn't ask you to do that. You're not asking me for money. People care. We still know each other. Yeah. You can still see anyone, like you see your family often, we have support support systems, you can interact with each other, and there's so much potential for our country. There's so much that can be done here. And in, you see it everywhere you look if you're trying to see it. Ooh, you see it if you're trying yeah. to see it. Because it is on record that we are the most entrepreneurial country in the world. Meaning you can start, the way you can plant anything and it grows here, you can start a business any day with so little in Uganda and you can actually grow it. Uh, I have a few more people asking questions, but before I do, no, these ones are comments, really. Uh, someone is asking what the name of the Facebook group is. It's called Her Working Women. Mm -hmm. If you go on my Facebook page, you can see it. You had that, Florence. Patsy says she joined the Her community last year on Facebook, and she won herself a personal development course as well. And she says she would definitely recommend this to the ladies. Patsy, thank you for that recommendation. <laughs> We know that you've also started great things. Marembo, any day now you might be here uh, on the seat that Natalie is occupying. So let's, let me ask you two more questions, Natalie. Earlier on, you mentioned, my mentor told me to charge. That's something we believe in very strongly here. Tell us, someone is probably thinking, why would Nat Natalie need a mentor? Everybody needs a mentor. Why? More than one and forever. You need so many mentors. <laughs> Why? Why do we need, need mentors? Because your mentor is someone who's walked the path ahead of you. They can tell you, don't do this, do this, read this book, try this. This is good advice. It's wisdom. And they care about you. You need to build a relationship with someone who is invested in what you're doing and who has knowledge that you don't have. Otherwise, us young people will never learn. We'll take 20 years to learn anything if we're not asking and learning from our elders. Ooh, guys. Mentors are so important. But Natalie, how, what's going on? It's like, the, it's like the girl grew like 50 more years in a short period of time. So mentors, and, and that statement you made that... Check. That Check. mentor has 20 Check. years of experience. If you're wise, you can tap into it. If you're not, you can also take 20 more years to learn the same thing which they already learned. Exactly. And then waste your time. Wow. That doesn't, that's not good. So let's talk about this whole, um, oh, uh, Ariho Kamara says, give us a glimpse into your schedule. <laughs> How do you do so much in 24 hours? Because in there is her, in there is a, 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 all that. But So that question of, of Ariho Kamara, as well as the question that is still lingering out there, Dr. Natalie Bitaturi. You are a young woman. How do you have doctor against your name? Because we know you didn't do medicine in school. Mm. <laughs> that one was another accident. <laughs> <laughs> Too many accidents. <laughs> my university that I did my undergraduate degree, Dean somehow has been seeing me or following me, and they invited me and gave me an honorary doctorate in innovation. Oh, but you see, it wasn't an accident. You've been <laughs> innovating. You see, that can sound like, but not, no one wakes up and gives someone an, on, but an honorary doctorate as a young woman, that is amazing. I thought it was an accident. I it called wasn't. them, I said, I got this email. Is it a scam? Is something wrong? <laughs> was it meant for me? And the lady's like, isn't this Natalie? I'm like, yeah. yeah. No, no, it's on purpose. Will you be coming? I was like, oh, okay. Okay. And I told my parents and they were excited. They're like, are you sure? Do Bye. they want us to pay? <laughs> So we were all nervous until they gave me the actual paper. For real, like, where you don't tell anyone until you have the thing. Like, yeah? we were sure. They were yeah. so nice to us. And my dad kept saying, Tali, if they ask me for money. <laughs> I love it. 
<laughs> By the way, Natalie's mom is in the house. We love her so much. Shout out to you, Carol. And of course, Mr. Patrick Witatore, we hope you're watching. You've raised an amazing young woman. It's not every day that a parent would sit back and listen to their daughter speak. And I think you're feeling very, very proud this morning because we are, we are feeling very proud of you. Maybe before I hand over to Mr. Chris Kawesa, Natalie, the question that Kamara asked, mm. what does your schedule look like? How are you able? You just told us about how you're drinking your food and then somehow <laughs> you have time to mentor women and to help people with Musana cuts, And then you're going to all sorts of, I mean, uh, do you have more time than the regular person? You know, you I have, have a, a mug that says, you have the same hours in the day as Beyonce. Oh! And that really motivates me. <laughs> if Beyonce can do all that, yeah. let me try. <laughs> I think you have to prioritize. You have to be super organized. And you have to be efficient with your time. So I learned early, I read the four-hour work week by Tim Ferriss. Oh. And I had to just start doing things that remove notifications, remove phone calls, remove things that distract me. So everything is planned in my schedule. By Sunday, I, my whole week now is in my calendar already. It's set. So I can just go and focus. So I'm not checking my phone in meetings. I'm dealing with what I'm dealing with now. And as soon as it's done, action items, you know what to do, hand over, go. You have to like really trust people and give them responsibility. So I'm very lucky. I have a very good team mm. that we've taken time to recruit correctly, to train correctly, to make sure that they love the company, they are passionate about what they do. I don't need to micromanage. I don't need to call and say, have you done this? Have you checked this? Have you done that? I trust you. You know what to do. We've discussed and agreed. Hand off. Do it. Let them trust. And you have to track everything. Keep a paper trail, which I know most people don't like. Mm. Keep minute no notes on every minute. You have to take meeting notes. You have to use Excel sheets. You have to write down stuff. Don't be making payments and you can't remember, I lent my brother the money from the business, but then I needed to buy this oh, and gosh. then I needed to do that. Write everything down. <laughs> There's apps for that. You have to be organized. Wow. You have, have you had people? You have to be organized. <laughs> have systems, trust people and Deal with what you're dealing with at that point. Don't be distracted. Natalie, what a pleasure it's been interviewing you. You've brought so much wisdom uh, so far. And now I'd like to hand over to Mr. Chris Kawesa, who is the leader of Business Garage here at Worship Harvest. Thank you so much, Pastor B3. Uh, Natalie, it's a pleasure. Yeah. You know, so much wisdom in a little girl. Oh, yeah. Little so girl. much wisdom in a little girl. And I think we have really learning all of us. Yeah. I was thinking right there that if I want to see Mr. Patrick Bittaturi or Mrs. Bittaturi, Carol Bittaturi, I just need to meet her. Yeah, you've met them yeah. by meeting her. Because she's a product of them. So if you want to hear from Carol Patrick, just come find Natalie. Because I'm sure they're very busy for us. But thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, first of all, I want to celebrate your dad and mom. Yes. For allowing you to shine in your own right. Because as I was growing up, I studied with many uh, people whose parents were wealthy, and they guaranteed, they told them, this is my money, wow. find your, you'll find your own business. And I know you've had some of that. Yeah. So I want to celebrate your parents for bringing you up and helping you to, to, to thrive. <clears throat> uh, you're a good follower. Yeah. You're a good follower. On the other hand, I know many children who are not following their parents, yes. even when their parents want them to come and run their businesses. So a good follower, and hence your wisdom and everything that you're doing. And that's something for us to learn. So, businesses, businessmen are castigated globally for being ruthless and mean, but I've not seen any businessman or woman come here and they don't, have, they don't love people. Every business person loves people, and the things you're doing uh, with the people in the communities, the social business, supporting young business people, giving out your life for them, and teaching them everything that you know is powerful. So the love for people is what I see in your story. You love people, you want everyone to be better, and grow up and, and get some of the things that you have. I'll ask you two questions. The first one is a simple one. The next one is, I think, where you will have to really talk to us a lot. How does one get a Musana cut? Uh, because there might be people there. You know, we have lots of missional communities yeah. and people are going out to do frontiers to support the communities. How does one get a cut uh, from you? So we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and we have a website and there's a phone number and an email address. So however you want, just get in touch with us and we'll handle the whole process for you. Awesome. Great. <clears throat> so this social business thing, 
Social business, in my view, is uh, a substitute to our donations. You know how we go to donor yes. uh, company, uh, rather countries and they give us funds to do things. When you do social business, you're basically uh, sharing your profits with other people. Uh, if you do a business like Mosana Cuts, what you'd ideally invest and run on your own, you're saying, young men and women, come and we share together. I give you this thing, you run. Because you can run Musana, you can manage 100 Musana cuts yeah. and put them in places and own, that, and own the business. An employer, 100 or so people. But you choose to call in uh, young people and educate them and teach them and give them an asset for them too. So for me, it's a substitute for donations. Uh, I want you to encourage us there because all businesses can have social aspects. Instead of earning 10,000 shillings from 500 people, you choose to earn one shilling from 5 million people and you get the same amount of money, but you're helping many other lives out there change. So, so we have business people here, we have people out there who are wondering what is this social business thing about. And also talking about the impact it can have on our country, yes. especially. You went to Ivanda, Ivanda Bushen, Ivanda, and you helped 5,000 people. You planted the seed. Maybe 20 or 30 got something, but they got something. Mm. So tell us, how can, our, how can we start to think social business? And every business, if you think, if you innovate, it can be social. Instead of going and looking for money to come and help communities, see, all these NGOs are really trying to do something social. But it, does, it has failed to create an impact because they come and give, like you said, they come and give, and then the cow is eaten. So how can we, how can you encourage us to change that story? And where can we learn these things from? So I believe social business is a replacement for CSR and NGOs for me. So personally at Simba, I stopped them giving donations. So now we invest in people. Because the difference with a social business like Musana or 500K, uh, how they're different is once you have the skills, you have them. I can't take them away. Yes. They're not going to expire. They're not going to run out or die like a cow. You get that skill and that empowerment. It's the agency it gives someone to feel I can solve my own problems. And the problem with these NGOs is we just get used to sitting and waiting for someone to give us something. And that's destroying our minds, especially with young people. If you've grown up in a village and all you see are church NGOs, the Muzungu NGOs, this one has come to give us maize, this one is giving us cows, this one is giving us this. Even some of the government projects. When I interviewed some of them, they have received money from the government to like start a group and start a business. They hired a border guy and now the kids are all sitting at home. I'm like, that's not helping you. You've taken that money, bought your border, the border guy is working, him is earning, but you're all just sitting at home idle. That's not helpful for the country. These are untapped minds. You all have an idea. You all have genius in you and passion and something that you can do to help your community. And with social businesses, it's about going beyond profit. You need to make money so the business sustains itself. Because the problem with being a charity, you're also always asking for money. When you ask for money, you have to do what the person who gave you the money tells yep. you. I want this target, you must give to these people. I want accountability on this. I don't want that. I want the people to do what they want with the money. They are smart, they are able, let them decide. They are adults. They are able to do these things for themselves and make choices. So when you give someone something, you invest in them. I don't want to give anyone money. I can never just say, here, I have. I've gone. No. What are we going to do with this money? Are you going to get a skill? And I'm going to check on you in two months. How is it going? How far have you reached? What else do you need? Do you need resources in time, in mentorship? Because people always think it's capital. Oh, I can't move my life, I don't have capital. Capital is like the fourth problem you have. You just don't realize it. You first have to change your mindset and get that agency and feel like you can do something. And that's why I love social business, because that's how we're going to have lasting change. Awesome, friends. This is awesome. Let's celebrate uh, Natalie. Capital is the last, the list of your problems. Mm. The most important thing is the mindset. Yeah. So, Natalie, I think we are going to nudge, we are going to look for you yeah. Yeah, to help us in this social thing because we have our businesses and we need to think about that. Not to give out money or CSR, like so, but to help us model them into social businesses because I think that's the way to go. So, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Over to you, Pastor. Wow. Peter.
What an amazing interview. So much wisdom. I would encourage you to go back and watch this again. And especially the people in Worship Harvest, you lead missional communities. And this is what we've been, we are doing out there in the frontiers, that instead of giving people hell, what we call a handout, we want to empower them to solve their own solutions and respect them and know that God was already working there. We are coming in as catalysts for social, spiritual, and economic transformation. Thank you so much, Natalie. It's been so good having you. We still had many questions, but time is up.